much. Okay, thanks very much, Dan, and uh, thanks for the invite to come uh, to um, a really nice, uh, warm location. I like the hotel on the beach. It's a bit distracting. I sort of wanted to stay there today, but anyway. Um, what I'm going to talk to you, I, I, <clears throat> the, uh, the, I, I didn't quite realize that the hour and a half uh, possibility for a presentation was quite literal. Uh, so my original presentation was somewhat smaller, uh, but I, <clears throat> what I decided to do was to uh, give a fairly uh, extensive, um, not history, but uh, really background to uh, the, um, you know, the liposome, the lipid nanoparticle area, uh, starting uh, <clears throat> going to some, a little bit of depth with, with, with small molecule systems, which I really had not initially intended to do, but actually it's a very good background for how it is you might attack the problem of delivery uh, using, uh, using nanoparticles for macromolecules such as sRNA, mRNA, plasmids, CRISPR, you name it. Okay, so <clears throat> the, um, we, have, we have some pretty ambitious uh, objectives here. <clears throat> You've been hearing about this from you know, various, uh, various sources. Uh, you all know what the problem is. But I just want to reiterate again that it's, it's not a, this is not a minor problem. Uh, the, uh, we're trying to inject into the circulation uh, <clears throat> our various, uh, it might be a drug packaged in a small system have it circulate around the body, have it go to a particular location such as a tumor, in this case a tumor in the, in the lung, uh, get there, move out of the circulation, um, get to a target cell, get inside that cell, and in the case of macromolecules, actually deliver the contents to the inside of that cell. Um, now, <coughs> the human beings have been evolving for a few million years, along with uh, viruses and that bacteria and other things trying to do uh, very similar things. So we have pretty elaborate protections against that, against these, these kinds of events. And so the fact we've made any progress at all over the last 20 years is pretty remarkable. Uh, and uh, we can start to see ways now that we can actually perform, actually do some of these things in a, in a really sensible way. And so the, um, the basic message that I have is, uh, is one of uh, some, you know, some optimism uh, even, <clears throat> because we are tackling a fundamentally extremely difficult problem, and to imagine that there's any simple way through it uh, is, uh, is, uh, is not right. Okay, uh, so the <clears throat> with that as a preamble, um, and as a, as a um, you know, uh, pointing out some of the difficulties that we face, let's just go back to the idea of developing new drugs in general. And the... Um, I think it's pretty hard, to, pr pretty easy to make this statement, pretty obvious, uh, that it's very hard to develop uh, new drugs, and particularly small molecule drugs. Uh, I don't know how many uh, <coughs> hundreds of thousands of small molecule uh, compounds that have to be uh, tested in order to, uh, to get to a small molecule that might, might make it through to the clinic. Uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a, as you're aware, a very large number and we now have something on the order of 20 or so new, uh, new small molecules being approved each year. Uh, biologics are coming along with uh, something on the order of uh, six or seven. And this, when you consider the worldwide effort that's going into making this happen, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the, anybody who starts off with, with a desire to develop small molecules, I think, is being uh, pretty darned optimistic. Biologics, the odds are somewhat better. Of course, you do get to the situation, even when you get these drugs approved, that, they may, that in some part of the population uh, they're going to be toxic and so therefore uh, will have to be removed unless there's some specific test for them. So, the, and I, think, so I think the, the, uh, the, the concept or the, uh, the belief that most of the people in this room is that it's much easier to improve old drugs or to enable... Uh, <coughs> Uh, enable biologically active, active macromolecules to become drugs. And so the two kinds of drugs I'll be considering here are uh, <clears throat> drugs such as anti-cancer drugs and uh, drugs such as uh, macromolecules such as sRNA. So a 500 molecular weight in the case of uh, most small molecule drugs, about 13,000 or so uh, for, uh, for molecules such as sRNA. So how can we improve old drugs? Um, this is pretty easy, uh, the, um, or pretty easy at least in concept. Small molecules go, <coughs> drugs as you're aware, go everywhere in the body. 
Uh, so that uh, and that's with less than 0.1%, and that's point, often in the range of 0.05 to 0.01% of the drug actually getting to where you want it to go. And then we wonder why we have off-target effects. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's pretty obvious uh, that uh, your, your chances are going to be dramatically enhanced with this kind of distribution. And so therefore, for small molecules, we need drug delivery systems uh, that enhance delivery to uh, disease sites and protect sensitive tissues. We're not going to achieve this all at once, but even if we get 5% or even 1% uh, of a given drug to where it needs to go, as opposed to 0.1%, this will make quite a difference. And so the improving old drugs is, uh, is really an extremely valid way to go uh, in, terms of, in terms of developing new pharmaceuticals. So what sort, of, what sort of drug delivery system should we use? Now, I, I, I'm a believer that one should uh, follow nature. Uh, every time we try and do something that uh, is, uh, doesn't, happen, doesn't occur naturally, we tend to run into problems. And so uh, what sort of, what sort of uh, delivery systems does nature use? And it uses uh, lipid-based systems, either a virus with a... Uh, <coughs> A toga virus that has a um, that has a lipid bilayer surrounding the genome, uh, <clears throat> or in the case of transport of fats uh, in the circulation, uh, lipoproteins uh, which are say on the order of 20, 20 nanometers or or well 10 to <clears throat> 10 nanometers or more up to uh, 30 or 40 for VLDL etc. Where you have a lipid monolayer surrounding and surrounding a core a hydrophobic core of, say, cholesterol esters in the case of lipoproteins. And so <clears throat> the, um, the obvious thing is, the, 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 the lesson to draw from this is that if you're working with lipids, you really have the, immediately a distinct advantage because you're just using, very, in, very, in very direct ways, uh, the same sorts of systems as occur naturally. And I'll show you one example where that, uh, <clears throat> that really uh, helps very dramatically uh, in the case of sRNA. And so the, um, the advantages of our lipid or liposomal uh, nanoparticles, lipid nanoparticle LNP, uh, are legion. And the, um, so this is, is just indicated here, self-assembling uh, biocompatible systems. We're using, in, in large part, lipids that occur in nature. Uh, we're, we're making direct analogs of the, uh, of the transport systems that nature uses. As I'll point out, uh, there are uh, very straightforward make the ways of making and loading lipid nanoparticles. We can effectively load anything we want uh, in, these, uh, in these systems. It's a highly flexible system. Uh, we can control size, drug retention, uh, <coughs> circulation longevity, fusogenicity, really any elements that you, <coughs> that you care to name. And they're also by far the most clinically advanced um, <coughs> of any, of any uh, nanoparticle system. So we now have that number there is wrong, about 10 LNP drugs that are approved for clinical use. This one thing on nomenclature, uh, the, um, the, uh, <coughs> we're now calling these systems lipid nanoparticles as opposed to liposomes. And the, um, is that a little, okay. <laughs> Am I supposed to speak more directly into it? Okay. The, uh, and the reason for that, and I'll point that out in a, in a, in, in a fair amount of detail, is, uh, is that some of the systems that we're working with now are, um, are, have a solid core, have a hydrophobic core as opposed to an aqueous core. And so it's, uh, just, uh, it's, actually, it's more correct to, to, uh, uh, to describe these systems as lipid nanoparticles rather than liposomes. Liposomes, of course, implies a net bilayer structure. Okay, as I indicated, LMP delivery is a uh, relatively mature technology. Most of the applications to this date uh, are concerned delivery of small molecules, and in large part to buffer the toxicity of those small molecules. Uh, so ambisome uh, is a major seller um, uh, <coughs> for, for uh, amphotericin B. Uh, to, guard, to guard against the nephrotoxicity associated with amphotericin B. This was approved in 97, along with another, uh, another liposomal formulation of, uh, of uh, amphotericin B, approved in 95. The ones in yellow are ones that we've been involved with, involved with in, the, uh, in the Vancouver group. 
uh, myosat LMP doxorubicin, metastatic breast cancer 2000, and the most recent one is one we've been working on for some considerable time, and I'll go into that in a little, uh, <coughs> a little depth, uh, called Markibo, a lipid nanoparticle formulation of Bincristin, which is approved in 2012 and is now just being introduced clinically. So the, um, <coughs> I should say that was improved for uh, approved for ALL, acute, 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 acute uh, lymphocytic leukemia. So the, um, there's many additional uh, drugs, uh, LMP drugs that are in clinical development. And these are examples from, uh, from the uh, Vancouver group, and there's many more of these. There's approximately uh, eight or nine here. Uh, the, top, the, 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 the majority of these are, again, uh, LMP formulations of cancer drugs, top, topotecan, uh, taxotere, et cetera. And then there's four formulations here. There are lipid nanoparticle formulations of, uh, SI, of small interfering RNA, sRNA. And I'll, uh, I'll indicate those in a little bit of detail uh, for uh, a product that we've been working on with, uh, with uh, a company called Alnylam in Boston. Uh, to silence uh, TT, the TTR gene, it's a transthyretin gene, uh, which can cause an amyloidosis if mutated. Okay, so you have to st start off from basics here. Why is lipid nanoparticle uh, delivery useful? And uh, as I've indicated, it's for small molecules, it's useful because we can increase the potency by getting more to a disease site, and that's basically by virtue of the EPR effect. Uh, and then reducing the delivery to healthy tissue. I mean, for doxorubicin, delivery to the heart, avoiding cardiotoxicity is an obvious advantage. These systems can also protect genetic drugs, and that by, that I, by that I mean antisense, siRNA, uh, <coughs> mRNA, and, uh, and uh, plasmids uh, from degradation. They can enhance their the <coughs> accumulation at, uh, at disease sites and can also, of course, and the very necessary component to enhance intracellular delivery. These things do not get across cell membranes on their own, as we're very much aware. And then the third point is that we don't have to put targeted information on these systems to get to at least to the first level, uh, the first generation of these systems. They can take advantage of natural or synthetic, in, in the second generation, synthetic uh, targeting uh, to be useful, to be, to, be, to be targeted to uh, particular tissues and particular cells. Okay, so just with regard to that natural targeting, why is, why is this, uh, this technology useful? And this is a, uh, a doxyl-type liposome, has a half-time in the circulation of about 24 hours, and just showing accumulation uh, <coughs> with the Indium-111 uh, as, as the, uh, as the uh, marker, as the, uh, <coughs> as the agent that we're visualizing here. Uh, and showing the accumulation in a, uh, in a lesion, this is Carpose, an individual with Carposi sarcoma, a lesion in the, in the calf, and you can see after 96 hours, uh, <coughs> the, after four days, that uh, the, uh, there's an appreciable amount in that, that's residing in that tumor as compared to other locations. And so the, uh, we, we are getting considerably more to where we want it. The drug can then pay out, and so this is a considerable advantage uh, for, this, uh, for this technology. Now, how, how small do nanoparticles have to be? I mean, we can go run down the scale here, but we're, we're, we're going to be in the, before we can get into uh, reasonable cell uptake for these systems, the 100 to 200 nanometer um, size is, uh, is important. Uh, in order to extravasate in the region of tumors, 100 nanometers is a good size. Uh, if we want to get through the lymphatics, then, uh, then we're into sizes on the range of about 40 to 50 nanometers. Low-density lipoprotein, which is made in the liver, has a size of approximately 20 nanometers. And so the, uh, <clears throat> these are the size ranges we want to get. So we don't want to go too much smaller than 10 nanometers or 8 nanometers where we, things get filtered out by the kidney and processed through to the urine. So we want to be in the 10 to 100 nanometer size range for, for most of these systems, depending on the application. If we want to get to bone marrow, we probably want to be in the range of 50 nanometers. Uh, if we're in the re region of 20 to 30 nanometers, we can expect, if we have extre extremely long-lived systems, that we're going to get in most locations except perhaps the brain. Now, we have to design these systems to, to, in, in very specific ways. And the, um, you know, one, one, of the, one of those points is that 
uh, <coughs> is the, the surface charge on, on the lipid nanoparticles always is going to cause us problems. Uh, so a surface charge that's, uh, that's, relative, that's relatively neutral, uh, a PEG coating is, uh, <coughs> is really necessary to avoid uptake by the mononuclear phagocytic system. Uh, the RES. The point being that if you, I don't know how many of you done the experiment where you put a lipid nanoparticle into the circulation and then say, well, what happens to these things when they're in the circulation? We're always looking in terms of arrival at a particular site, uh, but actually there's a there's a there, there's a process of adsorption of serum proteins onto the surface of these systems, which really dictates uh, their <coughs> their 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 fate, their their biological fate. And so most often these, these serum proteins will tag, will tag these systems uh, to be picked up by, by, the nearest, uh, by the nearest macrophage, the near, nearest phagocyte. And so we have to minimize serum protein absorption in order to gain access to tissues other than uh, macrophages, dendritic cells, etc. This is a fundamental point. If you start injecting uh, things into uh, <coughs> lipid nanoparticles into an animal that, have, that, 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 that are, are, are newly charged, uh, too large, whatever, um, what, what, all of your results are, you know, are, are, are going to be in some, in some ways um, you know, really made, relative, made somewhat um, not useless, but uh, the uh, systems will behave much better if you observe these very basic uh, design criteria. Okay, so how do you make uh, lipid nanoparticles? This is an old technique that we came up with uh, just almost 30 years ago now. Um, <clears throat> that uh, is extrusion or under high pressure. So, make, so simply just uh, taking, a, um, taking lipid, uh, vortex mixing it in the presence of, so a dry lipid film, vortex mixing it in the presence of, uh, in the presence of water to get large multilamellar vesicles on the order of microns. And then <clears throat> this is a, this, then forcing, forcing these, this milk-like suspension uh, through polycarbonate filters with a size range of, uh, of 100 nanometers or something in that range. And then you come out the other end uh, with uh, liposomal nanoparticles. So a pretty simple procedure. It, uh, it actually is, one, is, is the most popular procedure around for making liposomes presently. Uh, the limitation is that it's difficult to really go below about 50 to 60 nanometers. Uh, the, uh, as, as one tries to force uh, these systems through the really small filters, you start, you start to hit situations where uh, the, uh, the, it becomes relatively inefficient. But this freeze fracture electron micrograph just shows the progression that you could, that can achieve. It's 10 minutes to prepare these systems. The process is scalable and is being used in a, a quite a large number of applications clinically now. You can also use, as you heard yesterday uh, from uh, James Taylor, uh, microfluidic mixing, where you dissolve the uh, the uh, lipids in an ethanol, <coughs> in ethanol, and then and then other agents in an in an aque if, if you want to if you want to encapsulate them in an aqueous buffer, and then mix it, say a three to one sort of ratio, uh, to uh, <coughs> to achieve your rapidly mix using a, using the staggered Heromone system, uh, to uh, <coughs> to achieve small systems. You have to dialyze away the residual ethanol once, once these are made. These, this, this process, which is, uh, as uh, James was uh, emphasizing, is a bottom-up process. And so you're, <coughs> you're, ca you're really able to capture uh, the, uh, the, 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 these systems in their, so their so-called limit size. In other words, the smallest size is compatible uh, with, the, uh, with the molecular makeup of the particle. So how do you load these systems? And again, this is a process that you're familiar with, uh, <clears throat> but a, 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 an, older, an older technique that uh, was, we developed in the mid-80s. Mid uh, this is really, really very simple, just based on um, observations for uh, ways of getting uh, the um, <clears throat> ways of uh, measuring the pH of a, or the interior pH of a, uh, of a liposomal system. Say if you have pH 4 and pH 7, pH 4 on the inside, 7 on the outside. And to measure this, you use meth methylamine. <clears throat> this is a, a weak base, can exist in a neutral form. The neutral form can get across the membrane, gets repro reprotonated uh, on the, in the acidic interior, and then the positively charged compound cannot get back out. And so you end up with a distribution that reflects the pH gradient. So at equilibrium, 
uh, the methyl con methylamine concentration inside over that outside mirrors the proton concentration. So if you have three pH units, you've got a thousand-fold uh, enhancement in the, uh, in the concentration of the, uh, of the methylamine on the inside versus that on the outside. So a pretty simple sort of, uh, sort of uh, observation, and every, this was what I wish everybody knew. Uh, of course, the main, uh, the main uh, jump here is that many common drugs are also weak bases. They have primary, secondary, <coughs> uh, tertiary, uh, tertiary amines. And uh, so as a result, can be, can be susceptible to exactly the same, uh, same process when faced with a, lipid, uh, a liposomal system with an interior pH uh, that's acidic. And so this just indicates some cancer drugs that have that quality, but 50% of the drugs that you find in the Merck index uh, are, are weak bases, uh, probably for obvious reasons. This allows them to get to be in a neutral form and get inside cells uh, to, uh, to, reach their, uh, <coughs> to reach their targets. And so the, uh, there are a huge number of drugs for which uh, this kind of approach can be employed. So we can, we can just, <laughs> this is a very simple process, again, just having a pH gradient, in this case 3.5 units, uh, but uh, in the same way as, we, as I indicated for methylamine, the drug can go across in the neutral form, uh, get to the inside, become, become trapped when it, because it's uh, now protonated, and so at equilibrium, uh, you can hit these kind of thousand-fold or higher concentration gradients of the drug. And actually, it can be higher than that because you can achieve such high concentrations on the inside uh, that the drug precipitates out. And so the, uh, <coughs> the, actual, uh, the, actual, uh, amounts, the actual ratios outside to inside can, or inside to outside can be even higher. This is just an, just a, uh, an example for, uh, for Vincristin. Uh, it, <clears throat> the, the accumulation into 100 nanometer vesicles, the SPC cholesterol vesicles, uh, accumulation in response to a pH gradient. So this is a pH gradient of three and a half units. And you can see this is incubating at 60 degrees, essentially 100% encapsulation in a, a few minutes. And so this allows, uh, <clears throat> once, you, once you've cooled them down, to have systems that are stable for two years at four degrees. And uh, so in the wet formulation, and so the uh, really, really quite suitable, very suitable uh, for clinical applications. So the, um, so the, the process here for in the cartoon form uh, <coughs> is uh, simply in the absence, in the presence of a pH gradient, you can achieve really uh, quite remarkable uh, transmembrane distributions of weak base drugs, and that this is directly useful uh, for, for, um, for therapeutic uh, uh, possibilities. This is just to emphasize the point I made uh, that so with regard to the high concentrations that you can get on the inside, this is an example for doxorubicin, uh, which precipitates out on the inside to form these uh, nanocrystals uh, inside these lipid bilayers as a result of the pH gradient accumulation. Okay, so most, well, just to summarize, most small molecule drugs can be uh, encapsulated in lipid nanoparticles and the release rates can be precisely regulated. So we, we, have, a, we have an enormous amount of control here. Uh, the uh, encapsulation of fish direct lipid ratios can range from 0 0.05, well, as low as you want to go, uh, to approximately one on a weight-to-weight -weight basis with the lipid trapping efficiencies uh, greater than 98% routinely, uh, <coughs> routinely in, that, in that range. It corresponds to 5,000 to 100,000. This is uh, drug molecules at a molecular weight of, of 500. Uh, per 100 nanometer uh, vesicle, and we can, we can re regulate the drug release rates from uh, minutes to days simply by changing lipid composition, cholesterol content, uh, the extent of the pH gradient, uh, <coughs> or the drug to lipid ratio. As I mentioned, if you get more on the inside, it tends to precipitate out more, and so therefore uh, <coughs> the, uh, the, the, the rate of efflux is proportional to the amount that's in the free form, not in the, uh, not in the uh, precipitated form, and so you get, uh, you get slower release rates, slower net release rates. Okay, moving, so for small molecules, we're in good shape. Uh, we can, as I said, encapsulate anything that's a weak base, and actually things that aren't weak bases, we can make into pro weak bases that are pro-drugs and accumulate those and then have them, uh, <coughs> once they get out, say with an ester linkage between that and the weak base, uh, be converted to a, uh, their active form. Uh, we've done this with, with uh, Taxotere. I'm not going to talk about that, but the, uh, <coughs> the, point, the point being that we, we, we have some real, some real control on the small molecule side. 
Obviously enough, we can't apply the same, the same approaches uh, to uh, sRNA, to very large molecules, molecular weight 13,000 or so. So what do we do in this case? And it's a, this has been a work over the last 10 years that started to solve this problem. Now the, um, the, the, the issue here is in order to, in order to efficiently load uh, negatively charged polymers uh, into lipid nanoparticles, we got to have something that's, it's, it's, this, uh, this is a, a charge, uh, a, a, some charge association is necessary. And so, the, uh, so we hit this problem that if you use cationic lipids, you're automatically uh, in rather toxic territory. Uh, so as I mentioned before, we don't want to have a surface charge on our lipid nanoparticles because that leads to rapid clearance and there's certain toxic, so there's no positively charged lipids in nature for good reasons, as I'll point out. Uh, and uh, so the, um, one wants to avoid uh, this, uh, this, this the positively char a positively charged uh, characteristic to the lipid nanoparticle. And so what we did was develop uh, ionizable cationic lipids uh, that have a pK of 6.5 or lower. And so that at low pH, they're, pos they're protonated and positively charged, but at uh, physiological pH, uh, they're, they are net neutral. And so we can then perform the uh, SI encapsulation or mRNA or CRISPR or whatever else you want to, you want to encapsulate at low pH, say pH 4, where the uh, cationic lipid is positively charged, and uh, <clears throat> then bring the pH back up to, um, to physiological pH values and then have a relatively neutral, a relatively neutral exterior. And so, the, um, how, how do we actually perform this encapsulation? Uh, so we're, here we're using, um, using the uh, microfluidic uh, mixer approach that James Taylor uh, summarized yesterday. And so, as he mentioned, you have the uh, lipids that you're using for your nanoparticle uh, it dissolved in ethanol, and this goes in via an ethanol stream. And then you have the aqueous buffer with the sRNA, so this is at pH, is pH 4. Uh, so that uh, there's a negative charge on the um, on the uh, <coughs> on the cationic lipid, uh, run, it, run it quickly. This is 40. The, 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 the typ a typical composition we'll use is 40 to 50 percent cationic lipid, 10 mole percent DSPC, possibly 50 percent cholesterol, and uh, one mole percent of uh, of peg lipid of a peg lipid in order to uh, in order to uh, stabilize these systems. So you run very, very, very quickly run this through. Now what happens, as uh, James was emphasizing, is that when you, when you go through this, this mixer, this is mixing in milliseconds and in tens of nanoliters uh, at a time. And so you're very, very quickly uh, ramping up uh, the polarity in the, re in, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the medium. And so the oligo plus cationic lipid, this inverted micelle here, um, this is a way of, of rational, rationalizing the approach, will be one of the first, one of the first insoluble agents to, for, to precipitate out a solution. Now, if you're moving fast enough, if this is going quickly enough, uh, obviously if you go slowly, then these things are going to associate with, with one another and you're going to get massive aggregation. But if you go fast enough, uh, then the next thing to fall out will be a peg lipid, which is somewhat more soluble, of course, in the, uh, in, it has a, in, in, in the, in the uh, medium. And so it will then come out and start to coat these systems in the way that you see here. So, and we have various simulations that show this, but PEG lipid is the predominant coat lipid. So it will stabilize these systems in whatever uh, size that, uh, <coughs> that uh, actually is whatever size one wants. Uh, if, if you don't have, there's also a precipitation event if you don't have enough of the, uh, of the oligo here to precipitate out the cationic lipid of this lipid itself if you arrange things right. And so you can end up with, with this mixed, my, mixed micelle system, some of which contain sRNA and some don't. And so this is a structure that you can, we've, <coughs> we have a, a considerable um, experimental data to support. I'm just going to show you a couple of things to convince you that uh, the structure is one that um, is one that uh, is real. Uh, this is a molecular level simulation by Peter Thieleman, a collaborator of ours at the University of Calgary, uh, who, as he put it, uh, used half the computing power in Western Canada to uh, to uh, simulate um, a few million of these molecules to over s microseconds to see what structures evolve, and so came up with the structure where the oligo is, indi is, is indicated here. Uh, James showed this picture yesterday. 
Another way to do it is to, um, you know, is to use negatively charged gold nanoparticles and go through exactly the same process. And as you can see here, again, you have this plum pudding sort of effect or current bun effect uh, that's indicated here with the gold nanoparticles uh, inside, the, uh, <coughs> inside these uh, lipid nanoparticles. And so the, um, the evidence, uh, this and the considerable other evidence, is that uh, the, the, the lipid nanoparticle systems exhibit a nanostructured core. Okay, so as I mentioned, the uh, size of these systems is uh, dependent on the, um, <coughs> on the composition. Bec and, and, and because of this rapid mixing effect, we can hit limit size systems. So as you put in more of the surface lipid, and this vary the amount of surface lipid to core lipid, then you can, um, <coughs> you can uh, basically make these systems smaller. And so 1% peg lipid, uh, we're hitting systems that are indicated here that are about 55 nanometers in diameter. You go to 5% peg lipid and you're down to about 25 nanometers in diameter. So by varying the amount of peg lipid on the surface, you can uh, really um, predict what your size is going to be. This is just indicated here on the size range of the, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a function of peg lipid content. Uh, you can. The, the, the peg lipid uh, surface area per molecule, uh, the best fit here is uh, 26 nanometers squared, but just showing that uh, the, um, the, you know, the theoretical uh, understanding of these systems uh, fits quite well experimental results. So we can predict on the basis of peg content uh, what's, what size these systems are going to be. Okay, another point on the peg lipid uh, the, uh, that's not intuitively obvious, but uh, we have to design it, at least for the applications that we're using for sRNA, so it dissociates from the, from the lipid nanoparticle after uh, we, we introduce these systems into the circulation. We obviously require it uh, for achieving small uh, nanoparticulate systems in the, um, you know, that are stable, stable in solution, that don't aggregate, uh, but there's a couple of issues here. Uh, one is that obviously the presence of that coded, I mean, our, our, our need or our desire at the end of this is to get systems uh, that, um, that are taken up into cells. And the PEG coding just prevents that. And so the extent to which we can get rid of the PEG coding after, uh, after introduction in vivo uh, is going to aid in uh, uptake into target cells. And for, for nanoparticle systems that contain nucleic acids, the PEG lipids themselves can be immunogenic. This is just showing uh, for a typical composition, as I was indicating um, a while ago, for uh, the um, you know, cationic lipid, uh, uh, cholesterol, um, and um, DSPC, and, uh, and PEG lipid. If they have empty lipid nanoparticles with those compositions, we can inject those till the cows come home into animal models and see pretty reasonable ph pharmacokinetics. This is a PEG lipid that stays with the carrier. It's got one with a, um, a, a, C, a C18 chain. Uh, but the point is here, we don't see any immune, any, any rapid clearance from immune, immune stimulation or immune uh, recognition. Here, uh, for systems that contain, uh, contain um, this is a CPG uh, antisense, so it's a pretty immunogenic, uh, <coughs> pretty immunogenic compound. We can see first injection that we see long circulation to lifetimes. Second and subsequent injections, we get rapid clearance. And we've traced this. You can then take systems that, have, that, have, that don't, do not have any sRNA in the, or any uh, oligo in them inject, and you'll see again these just rapid clearance. And so the, the point being that, uh, the, uh, again, there's a good reason to try and get rid of PEG lipid after, after injection. So what we did was design a PEG lipid uh, that uh, dissociates rapidly after injection. So if you have a C20 or C18 anchor, uh, the, uh, peg, the PEG coating will stay with these carriers for extended times. If you have a C14, so 14 carbons in the, uh, in the, uh, in the PEG lipid, and this uh, PEG lipid comes off rapidly, time on the order of two minutes. And so you can, uh, <coughs> you can uh, then have a system that's much more available uh, for, uh, <coughs> for interaction with target cells. Okay, so this is just to, some, this is kind of like we, we're getting, we're starting to get to the point now where actually maybe doing an in vivo experiment makes sense. We're starting to understand and have, have well characterized systems uh, that, um, that satisfy uh, a number of essential criteria. And these are that we have a near neutral external membrane surface, 
they're relatively non-toxic, they have the right size range, uh, we can encapsulate uh, material with trapping efficiencies approaching 100%, monodisperse, uh, a couple of thousand oligos if we want per lipid nanoparticle, a scalable and reproducible um, <coughs> technique for making these systems. So, just again in summary, we, we now have techniques, I hope I've convinced you, that are uh, available that we can, where we can encapsulate essentially all biologically active agents of interest in these systems. Weak-based drugs, <coughs> we can convert uh, other small molecules that aren't, aren't weak bases uh, to make hydrophobic weak-based prodrugs and uh, <coughs> load them that way. Negatively charged polymers of all, of all kinds, positively charged polymers, we can flip this around and do it the other way with negatively charged lipids and positively charged materials. But the flexibility here is enormous. Okay, so now we've got to this stage, what about applications? What can we do with these systems that uh, is, a, is of use in our field? And uh, so we're dealing with simple systems. I mean, well, they're not that simple, but they're, uh, <coughs> they're simple in terms of, uh, in terms of well, we, we could add a lot more, potentially add a lot more detail to these systems, but if we can get these systems to work, may we then have the basis uh, to move on to more sophisticated systems. And so we just have systems where we have the drug uh, that is um, encapsulated on the inside, in the case of a liposomal system, small molecule drug, or we have our lipid nanoparticle with sRNA inside it with this nanostructured core with no targeting information. We take advantage of natural targeting processes. Okay, so for, um, <clears throat> for conventional drugs, these, these are, the problem is pretty, you know, pretty simple. It's relatively simple. Because all we have to do is to get material in the region of, a, say, a tumor, and then the drug, have the drug pay out, and uh, then uh, the, um, that drug is able uh, to move into a, into a target cell simply because, I mean, that's what it can do. It's been designed to be able to get inside, inside cells. Uh, and so all we have to do is deliver more of it to where we want it. And um, what we require here then is small systems circulate for a long time and that they can then extravasate, extravasate in the region of a tumor and pay their, pay their contents out at, uh, at a reasonable rate. So I'm going to talk here about, <coughs> about formulations of vincristin. As you're aware, uh, it's a microtubule inhibitor. It's one of the most widely used anti-cancer drugs. Uh, it's 2 million doses per year. And primary indication on Hudson's lymphoma, cell cycle specific drug, as is indicated here. Uh, <clears throat> the, um, the, uh, the, the version of Vincristin I'm going to talk about is, a, uh, <clears throat> is, a, uh, is called Marquebo, is the trade name. Uh, it contains, uh, its, its diameter is 100 nanometers, contains uh, 10,000 um, Vincristin molecules per liposome. Uh, the composition is single myelin cholesterol, and that's because we want a, we want a system that's long circulating, but also because single myelin is a very robust lipid in terms of being able to, to keep material inside the uh, inside, keep uh, <coughs> molecules inside. And it gives you a pretty intact bi or a pretty robust uh, bilayer in terms of permeability. We have a therapeutic optimized half time for drug release of 24 hours, and I'll just indicate how important that is in a moment. So we can look at the efficacy of these systems. This is in a, uh, in a squamous cell carcinoma model on the flank of the animal. Inject a million cells day one, wait a couple of weeks until the tumor size is 100 milligrams. Inject via the tail vein. And what you see by virtue of the EPR effect are these long circulating systems, the circulation lifetimes, half times of, uh, of approaching 20 hours is that uh, for the lipid nanoparticle formulation of vincristin, we get a uh, considerable amount more of the drug to the tumor site compared to inject injecting the same amount of the, uh, of the free drug. <coughs> this is at two milligrams per kilogram. And so this, this leads to really dramatically uh, enhanced uh, potency. And so as you can see here, for the, for the uh, if this is looking at the tumor weight as a function of time, uh, that uh, the um, that if we if we uh, go in at the maximum tolerated dose, which is two milligrams per kilogram, uh, if any higher any any higher any higher amounts, and then we'll then we would kill the animals. Uh, then the um, the we can uh, we have a increase or a 
a decrease in the rate of the, the, the tumor. The tumor grows. The animal survive by a couple of days more. However, we can convert the drug from being a completely ineffective drug uh, to being an effective one simply by having it in a lipid nanoparticle uh, that uh, has the right payout rate. The importance of the payout rate is just indicated here. If we have DSPC cholesterol systems have exactly the same circulation lifetime, et cetera, uh, but a much faster release rate, uh, then we see uh, considerably less potency in terms of this animal model. So this is an optimized release rate with a single myelin cholesterol system. So all these things have to be designed in uh, to, your, to your system uh, and optimized uh, uh, in, a, in an appropriate way. Just to point out this, this, uh, also re the, 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 this formulation of Incristin also results in improved efficacy in people. This is a study that was completed in 2004, and it was uh, <coughs> of patients uh, presenting with, with um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. The usual treatment here is CHOP, and CHOP is cyclophosphamide, doxorubicin, oncovin, which is Vincristin, and prednisone uh, given in combination. And so the, uh, here we substituted uh, the uh, LMP vincristin, also called Marquibo, uh, for the free, vin free, vin the, the, the free vincristin. So this is, uh, has, the, has the name Lipochop. Um, so <clears throat> the uh, protocol here is uh, rituximab monoclonal antibody, CD20. Um, <clears throat> all of these on day one, cyclophosphamide doxorubicin, um, lipid nanoparticle vincristin at two mg per meter squared instead of the free oncovin, and then prednisone every 21 days, six to eight courses. And the basic point here is this is comparing against historical data uh, that this is the data that was used to get rituxin approved uh, as a co in combination with CHOP, and the bottom line is overall survival at two years. 70% on this, uh, on this uh, previous, previous study, uh, the um, coffee study, 98% uh, uh, <coughs> with a study where we're using the, um, the mar Marquibo uh, in, the, um, in, in the mix instead of the Oncovin. So the, uh, <coughs> the, um, this is unfortunately not, not, not data that one can use to get the drug approved. Uh, the, um, the FDA requires you to show that your drug has activity as a single agent. Uh, which um, causes some problems in getting the drug approved. Uh, <clears throat> but um, so the present status of this drug is 13 trials completed, 500 patients. A registration trial was completed in NDA, a new drug application made to the FDA in 2011. And it was approved by the FDA in 2012. And I should mention that this is about 20 years after uh, we first came up with this formulation. And having spent around $150 million dollars, and so the, uh, for those of you that are getting into the uh, drug development business, uh, this is a long and arduous uh, battle uh, that you, uh, you face in this process. And this is for a relatively simple system, as I indicated, uh, that um, this consists of a liposomal system with the drug on the inside. However, I'm very optimistic uh, that uh, this drug is going, to do, is going to do very well. There's now a registration trial in progress that uh, is in front line, not Hodgkin's lymphoma. And uh, it will be interesting to see how that progresses. So the future for small molecule drugs uh, that is that uh, most of these toxic molecules are going to be delivered in the nanoparticle formulations. I think we're slowly breaking that, uh, breaking that dam uh, to achieve enhanced efficacy, reduced toxicity. And so this is just running through these, uh, <coughs> running through these possibilities. So it's just a matter of hammering away. And, uh, the, uh, while we're, we're, we're not in, we're not, we still have 95% of the drug not going to where we want it, at least we have 10 times or 20 times more uh, going, to, going to a tumor as going to other locations. Okay, so the situation for small molecules is, uh, is, is, is looking increasingly optimistic. How about for genetic drugs uh, such as siRNA and uh, mRNA, et cetera. They're kind of a bit more complicated because not only do we have to get what we want to deliver uh, to, say, a tumor site, uh, we've got to get it inside, and then we have to break out of the endosome uh, to get that material to the inter interior of the target cell. So we, we've got, we thought we had, it, we thought it had problems before. Uh, we're, certainly, we're certainly in, in, in <coughs> the, 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 the problems have gone up quite considerably. So the, um, 
the, there, there are things that make you keep on going here, though, because obviously genetic drugs have enormous potential. You're all aware of the mechanism by, of, of sRNA for gene silencing, uh, but the point being that if we can actually get this to work, essentially any gene in the genome uh, is, uh, is, is available for silencing, including normally non-druggable uh, targets. And so it's a, uh, it, it's a, it's a really, uh, it's a really, it's one of those endeavors that so you're not going to take no for an answer. And uh, I think we're going to, with the, well, the field is now, is now shaping up quite nicely in terms of actually being able uh, to achieve these objectives for gene silencing. So we can, t we can, test, we can test systems uh, <coughs> with, with sRNA and, uh, and for, for gene silencing in, in some interesting ways. And uh, the, um, this is uh, just indicating a model that we use as a fairly high throughput um, approach. Uh, so this is using a factor seven model, <coughs> factor seven mouse model, uh, one of the, the factor, factors in the clotting cascade made in, made in hepatocytes and secreted into the circulation. So if we, if we silence that gene in hepatocytes, then we can just do a, a simple um, serum assay uh, to see how much we've, uh, we've knocked down uh, the, um, the we've, we've silenced that particular gene. So we're injecting the lipid nanoparticle factor seven uh, into the tail vein and then subsequently assaying for factor seven in the blood. So at time zero, uh, we, dose, we, dose, uh, we dose the mice over a certain range, 24 hours terminate the mice and assay the uh, plasma for factor seven. So we're using these, the non-targeted system that I indicated previously, lipid composition, usually uh, cationic lipid, DSPC, cholesterol, peg lipid, and the 40-10, 40-10 composition, although in some cases we change that, uh, but that's what we've been using for these comparative studies. So what we found was that the uh, factor seven gene silencing potency was very sensitive uh, to the species of the cadillac lipid that we, that we employed. All of these have a primary amine here, but just very small variations. And the, this Delin DMA with an ester linkage, uh, <coughs> a similar structure with an ether linkage, and then a ketal linkage here of Delin KDMA are three, example, or three early examples uh, that, uh, that we were working with. So, for the ester linkage, uh, the, we were seeing silencing, but we really had to go to pretty high doses, 10 milligrams of sRNA per kilogram body weight, to get 50% gene silencing. This is the percent of the residual factor seven. Then DMA, with the ether linkage, uh, <coughs> we're seeing silencing at one, one milligram per kilogram. Now, this one was non-toxic, and this one was, uh, the Glenn DMA was, was fairly toxic. We didn't have much of a therapeutic window here. So we thought, okay, well, maybe we need some stability. It's, we were thinking that this one is broken down relatively readily because of the ester linkages. And so with the ether linkages, this wasn't being broken down, and maybe that was uh, causing the toxicity. And that's why we went for the KDMA. But surprisingly, the KDMA was a lot more potent. And uh, so we started to hit this thing where uh, <clears throat> the, um, we're now down to about 0.2 uh, milligrams of sRNA per kilogram body weight in order to get 50% silencing of factor seven uh, following an IV, IV injection. So we started to hypothesize that the potency of the cationic lipids is really sensitive to their pKa uh, <clears throat> and membranelytic properties because these were some of the variables we could see that were, that, 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 that all these lipids um, all these lipids that we're using here have very slightly different, very slightly different pKa's, and, uh, all the, and, and, and the, they also have membranelytic properties, as I'll explain in a moment. And so, what we're thinking is that we get our carrier taken up in the, in the endosome. The pH is reduced by the inward directed proton pumps in the endosome uh, below the pKa of the cationic lipid. Uh, then the cationic lipids combine with the anionic lipids, the negatively charged lipids, to induce, as I'll show in a moment, non bilayer structures, uh, competing, at, competing, uh, the, the S, competing for the sRNA binding sites. So the sRNA is then released into the interior. So this is our, our hypothesis in terms of the uh, in terms of the approach. Now, you might ask, well, how can membrane lipids have membrane? How can cationic lipids have have lytic properties? And this is where we have to go back to some basic membrane biophysics. Uh, this is uh, lipid polymorphism. Lipids can adopt a variety of structures on hydration. We're most familiar 
uh, with the uh, lipids in a bilayer organization, but they can exist, of course, in micelles for lysolipids. But they can also exist in non bilayer structures, such as this hexagonal H2 phase, which bears little relation to a, a normal bilayer. So these are long tubes of lipids. These are kind of hydrophobic blobs with aqueous cores running through the center of these systems uh, <coughs> that are arranged in this hexagonal uh, sort, of, sort of pattern. So lipids such as, biological lipids such as phosphatidylethanolamine, if you take, extract them from biological membranes and put them in water, uh, they'll preferentially adopt the hexagonal phase rather than the bilayer phase. You can detect uh, the polymorphism by phosphorus NMR. That's just looking at the phosphorus in the phosphate of phospholipids. And so lipids that are in a, uh, fossil, in the, in a bilayer structure, you see this low field shoulder, high field peak, and this is just uh, indicate uh, just the characteristic of uh, the, 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 the phosphorus group here has a term in, uh, in NMR called the chemical shift down isotropy. And so the uh, this line shape is really characteristic of, of a molecule that's able to spin around its long axis but has rather limited emotional properties in other, in other orientations. And so the, for the hexagonal phase, you see a, a, a line shape that's reduced in, by a factor of two, high field shot with a reversed asymmetry. And this is just due to the additional motion uh, that can occur as these, as these uh, lipids <coughs> move or diffuse around these very narrow aqueous channels. So if we take a, 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 a negatively charged anionic lipid and combine it with a cationic lipid, uh, then the... Um, let see where, uh, and then you can see we can switch these lipids. Oh, this is phosphatidylserine, a bilayer structure. We add uh, equimolar um, uh, cationic lipid, and we see this hexagonal phase. For those of you that have ever wondered why uh, lipofectamine and uh, transfection reagents work, this is this is how they work. Uh, the um, you have the, <coughs> the, the, the 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 they consist of uh, of positively charged lipids. Those positively charged lipids will interact with the negatively charged lipids in your target cell, uh, essentially break open uh, that uh, membrane by uh, <coughs> causing local perturbations uh, uh, in, this, in this manner, structural perturbations, which allow large molecules to get in. And so we're just making use of a very simple biological phenomena or a very simple phenomena. The, re the way this happens is just simply the positive and negatively charged negatively charged uh, head groups can interact, causing a cone-shaped structure which is more compatible in a hexagonal phase as opposed to a bilayer phase. So this, uh, this, is, this summarizes a great deal, uh, <coughs> a great deal of, uh, of uh, observations and satisfies and is uh, consistent with, with, <coughs> with those observations. So cationic lipids induce these non bilayer structures in mixtures with all naturally occurring anion, uh, anionic lipids. This is the reason, of course, you don't find cationic lipids in nature, because if you did, uh, when the anionic and the cationic get together, you have problems. Well, you can do very simple calculations, which I'm not going to go through, but a single 100 nanometer uh, LMP can contain enough cationic lipid to destabilize a, uh, <coughs> the entire endosomal membrane. So it's a, uh, these are quite powerful in terms of their ability uh, to, uh, to disrupt the endosome. So what we did, and we kept eight chemists going for about five years, uh, we, we synthesized over 300 uh, cationic lipids with varying pKa and membrane lytic properties. And so this is just a progression, or a few of those, as I mentioned, the uh, the uh, ester linkage, going to ether linkage, going to a ketal linkage, and then coming up at the end here with this lipid that is called D DLIN MC3 D D DMA that had the best uh, the best properties of all. But this is the result, as I say, of a tremendous amount of work. What we found was, and this is looking at the, the effective dose for 50% gene silencing using this factor seven model. This is a log scale, so these are a thousand times better than these ones, he these ones here. Uh, that there was a very pronounced pH dependence, pK dependence, uh, to the uh, cationic lipids. And that a pKa in the region of 6.2 to 6.4 uh, was, really, uh, <coughs> was really optimal in terms of getting, uh, in terms of getting, uh, or getting, getting the, most potent, the most potent systems. So it's quite remarkable, actually. A change in pKa of one unit can take your activity down by a factor of 1,000. 
So <clears throat> the, um, again, this is consistent with our original thinking. We reduce the, PK below the, the pH below the pK of the cationic lipid. We get this combination and release uh, into nonviolar structure and the release of the, uh, of the uh, oligo into the, uh, into the cytoplasm. So we were able to take the potency of the, uh, in terms of the factor seven model, uh, from where we started around about one milligram per kilogram in 2008 to uh, the end of 2012, beginning of 2013, where we're now operating in the range of, uh, of uh, well, two to three micrograms of uh, siRNA per kilogram body weight. And this, is this is translates into, say, $100 for siRNA for an 80-kilogram person. So the cost of goods are, uh, issue is, is now is an extremely potent material uh, in terms of getting <coughs> factor seven knockdown and by extrapolation being able to knock out any other gene we want in hepatocytes. And so this, is, uh, this was quite a, quite a um, you know, <coughs> has been quite a journey in terms of getting systems that actually have real therapeutic utility. The, uh, so this is the MC3, which is the current gold standard, ionizable cationic lipid. Uh, these for, for hepatocyte delivery uh, <coughs> the, with an ED50 in the range of 0 0.005 uh, milligrams of sRNA per kilogram body weight. Okay, so why is this working? Um, for those of you that, uh, I mean, this, it, it's all, there was a lot of theory and all the rest of it going on there, but really what's going on uh, in terms of being able to, being able to see such, uh, such good silencing in hepatocytes. And in particular, what, where's the targeting agent here? In the same way that we were able to get more material to a tumor uh, by having a long circulation lifetime and taking advantage of the EPR effect, what's happening here? We know we're shedding the code on these systems very quickly once they get into the circulation, but why is it they're being taken up, uh, <coughs> taken up by hepatocytes? And it turns out that we're, we really, uh, we, we, we lucked into, we, this was really luck. Uh, we, <clears throat> we, we were taking advantage of a natural targeting process. Now, you'll remember, as I said, that uh, the, uh, the, trans, the things that are transported in the, uh, in the blood, fats that are transported in the blood are transported in lipoproteins. And fats that we eat are packaged into, into lipoproteins called chylomicrons. In the, on the, in, the, <coughs> in the gut, and then taken to the liver. And up, that, the uptake into the liver is mediated by uh, apolipoprotein E, which is a readily dissociable um, lipoprotein. It moves to the, uh, to the chylomicrons to facilitate their uptake via the LDL receptor. And it turned out that we were, we were using exactly, we were piggybacking on this, this exactly the same system. And so, because our systems in some way mimic uh, these fat globules that are, are taken up, are, 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 are used naturally, APOE uh, associates with these particles very readily. Uh, after in, this is after injection, and then we get uh, uptake by the scavenger receptor, LDL receptor, on the hepatocytes. Now, you can do some very straightforward experiments to prove this. When APOE knockout mouse, uh, these systems don't work. Uh, if you incubate the, uh, these particles with APOE before injecting them, then they work again. And so the, uh, the, um, the evidence behind this is, uh, is, is, is extremely, is very, is, very, is very substantial. But it points out that taking advantage of what nature has uh, or, or is going on naturally can, can, can lead to really profound advantages. Okay, so we now have sRNA systems that can silence any gene in hepatocytes. Uh, with therapeutic indices, and I didn't mention this, uh, in excess of 1,000. There's three drugs in clinical trials. Uh, <clears throat> liver cancer, hypercholesterolemia, this is a PCSK9 drug. And I'll just mention a few clinical trial results for uh, the uh, transthyretin uh, drug that alnylam uh, has been, um, that we've been working with, with alnylam on uh, <clears throat> for the last five years. So transthyretin uh, is a um, is a liver express protein. It goes through the tetramer. It binds and transports the retinal binding protein, vitamin A, uh, or at least which, which then transports vitamin A in the circulation. There's a lot of mutations in this, uh, in this uh, TTR gene, and those mutations can lead uh, to uh, a destabilization of the tetramer, uh, which uh, then leads to amyloid fibrils, as indicated over here, which can accumulate in nerve tissue and in the heart. Uh, it's, uh, the prevalence is not high, but there's a significant number in the Western world, as is indicated here. 
And so the mechanism of action of an sRNA that knocks out uh, production of the mutant and wild type uh, is to reduce the TTR that's circulating. And, uh, and then uh, uh, by virtue of the reduction in the circulation, hopefully result in uh, depletion of, um, of, those, uh, of the amyloid plaques and then recovery from the cardiomyopathy and the neuropathy. Uh, so the first study here was in human, healthy volunteers, phase one study. Uh, <clears throat> it's the various dose levels going from 0.01 to 0.5 milligrams per kilogram, 60-minute IV infusion. Uh, and of course, we want to assess the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Uh, so the, uh, this was done a couple of years ago and points out here that at a dose level of 0.15 uh, milligrams per kilogram, you see profound and really uh, extended uh, gene silencing of the TTR gene at those, at the, in, these, uh, in, in, in these volunteers. And so the, um, if we go to higher 0.5, you see extensions, basically going out to nearly two months uh, instead of in the, in the, in, uh, in the, for silencing of, of the TTR gene. So I should also mention that this, I don't have a slide in this deck, but uh, the, um, the, uh, there's a, for, for non-human primates, it's one of the more, more spectacular results I've ever seen, that the same milligram per kilogram dose level uh, for humans, for non-human primates, uh, the, 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 the silencing curves were identical. You could lay one on top of the other. So you're almost getting preclinical validation of a, uh, uh, preclinical clinical validation. So safe and well tolerated, no adverse drug reactions, 94% knockdown uh, <clears throat> and, the, and uh, with, with, the, with the high levels of durability. So once, you're, once every uh, two months uh, dosing, it's now in phase, phase three studies uh, <clears throat> and um, you know, those results will hopefully be reported uh, sometime towards the end of next year. Uh, I just want to close on a um, saying, okay, this is interesting, but uh, can, we, is, uh, can we use this? And uh, James was uh, showing some results here uh, yesterday. Uh, the APOE is, uh, we're seeing excellent uptake into hepatocytes, but how about other tissues? Uh, <clears throat> and as you can see here, the LDL family is really, uh, receptor family is really very widely distributed, obviously enough across uh, many, many tissues. And I'll just uh, say a couple of things about the brain. Most, so most cells re 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 contain receptors for APOE, and so these systems really do have uh, more general applicability than just for, uh, <coughs> for, uh, for the liver. And so the point being here that APOE is the major lipoprotein in the brain. And so the uh, <coughs> APOB, et cetera, aren't, aren't there to, to anywhere near the same extent that they are in the rest of the body. So APOE is the major one. So there's lots of this around, and so the potential for forming, uh, for using the same targeting uh, approaches is, uh, is there. And as uh, James was pointing out uh, yesterday, uh, <coughs> the presence of APOE, in the presence of APOE, uh, the ability, 100 percent of neurons in tissue slices will accumulate and in, in tissue culture will, uh, will accumulate. So in, the, in, in these systems, you get 100 percent transfection and uh, very effective uh, gene silencing. And so this is just uh, indicating for in tissue culture, as James was saying yesterday, uh, silencing P10. That's uh, <coughs> quite, uh, what turns out. If so the 3.3 micrograms of sRNA per, per mil, we could actually go almost a, a hundredfold lower and see equivalent effects. Direct injection into the brain, again, uh, the, with the P10 sRNA, uh, one can see is profound and, as it turns out, long-lasting. Uh, long uh, suppression went up to 15 days. It'll be interesting, or we're in our next series of experiments, we're going out uh, to um, you know, substantially longer and I suspect we're going to see very long-lasting gene expression. The fun part of these studies is going to be, uh, which we're moving into now, is going to be continual infusion in the brain by, by diffusion pumps to see if we can see global knockdown. Uh, and um, the, the initial uh, observations are looking optimistic. Okay, uh, so just a few words about the future, which I think is pretty positive. Uh, so, as I mentioned, for small molecule drugs, uh, the, there's a normal, enormous commercial opportunities here. 
uh, that as we apply this technology, and you, you'll see that here we're talking about cancer drugs, but there's a wide variety of other drugs we should be looking at, uh, particularly immunosuppressive drugs, uh, to get them going more particularly, more particularly to where we need them to go. These systems are accumulated by uh, the immune system. We have direct and natural targeting to those, uh, to those cells, and we should be taking advantage of it. Um, in the case of genetic drugs such as uh, sRNA, mRNA, uh, plasmid, CRISPR, etc., uh, <clears throat> the, these systems that, we've, that have been developed for sRNA are immediately translatable to these other um, potentially therapeutic uh, 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 molecules. And uh, so the, the, we, we're really starting to break the back, actually, of the, uh, of the delivery uh, needs. Uh, for, for sRNA, there's a huge, obviously a huge number of targets. Uh, as we move into the mRNA and, uh, and the gene editing fields, uh, the, um, the potential gets uh, substantially more. So it's kind of a fun time, actually, to be in this field uh, the, uh, because the, the, the range of applications, as we're all aware, is expanding very dramatically. So right now we can only we have a very effective systems for for the for the liver and for the brain if you want to go in by direct injection not everybody's cup of tea but I suppose it's you know for very life threatening disorders that's that is a viable but it is quite viable but we're we're now we're now starting to approach and I think what we're going to see is that for other tissues immune cells distal tumors bone marrow, et cetera, that we're going to be able to develop similar systems, maybe with not quite the level of potency that we have for the liver, uh, but certainly potent enough to warrant clinical utility uh, and clinical investigation. So you'll see many of those things coming in as we move forward. So what I've talked about here is obviously the result of a work of a lot of people over a long time. And so I have to make uh, many acknowledgments. Alcana, now called Acuitas, Mick Hope and Tom Madden, who I've worked with for over 30 years and who have been instrumental in the sRNA story. Uh, Ying Tam, uh, also playing a big role. Precision Nanosystems, you've already heard from. Uh, Nathan Bellavo, who was one of the first people in my lab to start to develop this technology, uh, <coughs> along with uh, James and, uh, and Ewan Ramsey. Uh, Carl Hansen, who was, uh, who, who was the uh, originator of the microfluidics ideas, uh, Tech Mira, uh, <coughs> the, um, Sean Semple, and Amin Sandhu, and others who have played big roles there. Al Nylon, we worked with an excellent team at Al Nylon, uh, led by Mark Tracy uh, and, uh, and Martin Mayer, uh, Kinna Kink, and uh, Mano, Mano Haran. Uh, UBC Chemistry, uh, my own group uh, in, uh, in the uh, chemistry department, and the UBC Brain Research Center led by Brian Vicker. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention.